So how's everybody doing today? I'd like to walk every, uh, welcome everybody to the USGS and NCCWSC Climate Change Webinar Series. Where it's hosted here uh, through the National Conservation Center through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And today we have a presentation from David Demore, and he will be discussing assessing soil moisture availability across the Gulf of Alaska region. So at this point, I will hand it off to Abigail, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks. Hi, this is Abigail Lynch. I'm a research fish biologist with the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dave Demore, who is a research soil scientist with the Pacific Northwest Research Station of the USDA Forest Service in Juneau, Alaska. He received his PhD in Natural Resources and Sustainability from the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 2011. He started his career in natural resources as a forester with the Peace Corps in Mali, West Africa, where he did reforestation and soil conservation projects. Demore also worked in forests of the Pacific Northwest as a soil scientist and forester. He has worked in southeast Alaska for the past 20 years on soils and forestry products related to nutrient cycling. His recent research um, work has examined the interaction between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems with a focus on restoration and carbon cycling. Welcome, Dave. Thanks very much, and uh, glad everyone could join us today and uh, to talk about uh, this project. I'm really excited about this, uh, you know, modeling work that we've been able to do uh, in the region, and I'm looking forward to highlighting some soil moisture topics uh, across the uh, the Gulf of Alaska region. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge my, my co-authors and collaborators on this project, Francis Biles, Julian Schroeder, Tom Kurkowski, and Scott Ruff. Uh, Francis and I are both uh, um, uh, employees of the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, Julian, Tom, and Scott work at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, actually the Scenarios Network for Arctic and Alaska Planning. Um, and this project was a, a joint project with uh, a, a three-way project with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, the Forest Service, and the uh, the Department of Interior's USGS Climate Science Center, Alaska Climate Science Center, which funded this proposal uh, uh, jointly. I'd like to acknowledge that and uh, really appreciate the, uh, the support um, and the, the, a good example of how we're trying to come together to address questions like this across a very vast region uh, in Alaska and the coastal fringe. Um, so just to start off to kind of put us in perspective, we are working in uh, what is known uh, as the Gulf of Alaska region, which is this northeast Pacific coastal margin of a, a coastal terrestrial fringe that runs around the Gulf, uh, kind of starting uh, southern British Columbia and extending up uh, off into the Aleutian Islands. So a tremendously important area in terms of fisheries production, uh, uh, forest resources, um, and fresh water. So this region actually has a few large rivers, but not a, any one major river which drains the region. We experience two to five meters of rainfall throughout the region, which culminates in an integrated discharge of about 800 cubic kilometers of water coming off the land into the Gulf. That's about um, four times the discharge of the Yukon River, uh, and it's actually greater uh, in, cumul in the cumulative discharge than the Mississippi River. So a huge amount of fresh water. So we're concerned about that water and its uh, transit time across uh, the soils of the region. Specifically today, uh, we're going to be focused on a subsection of this region, uh, which we call the Southeast Alaska Drainage Basin. So that's our area of interest uh, in the, the transboundary rivers and the um, extended island archipelago of Southeast Alaska where the modeling was done. This map also shows the extended coastal temperate rainforest region, which actually has four subregions extending from uh, south central Alaska all the way down to northern California. Um, and we have a broader uh, research work group working on these broader regions. But today we're focusing on um, soil moisture relationships in the uh, Alaska drainage basin. The landscape is a, a tremendous mix of vegetation and, and the evolution of this landscape actually is mostly driven by water. Um, as you can see here, we have forests, but they're interspersed often with uh, uh, open 
heath and bog vegetation. So uh, mixes of, of kind of the, the culmination of vegetation, and uh, we'll talk about that a little later, but, but really um, a combination of waters leading to uh, varying vegetation communities. This is a model uh, that we use in soil science. I am a soil scientist, and so we use a model called the Katina model. Um, and it really works well here because it illustrates how topography really influences the development of vegetation-associated soils. Um, and this is a, a really applicable model in this region because uh, topography is destiny here. If you can drain water, you end up with um, much deeper, well-developed uh, uh, soils, mineral soils. If water isn't um, transited away from the system, you end up with peatlands. And we have at the bottom there, those are dicic typicrohemists in soil language, um, actually can be up to four or five meters deep of organic matter, organic peat, and hold water really closely uh, and um, pool it on the surface. Again really distinctive soil types and different processing of water. And so one of the challenges is trying to understand how this water is distributed on the landscape, um, what its residence time is, and several questions related to um, what that water is doing in terms of its feedback in not only the vegetation, the biogeochemistry, and really assessing how that's going to change. And I'm going to outline some of the things uh, that we've done in that arena. But the other constraint we have is that we don't have maps uh, of soil moisture which transcend the whole landscape in the region. So our challenge was to actually come up with a model where we had um, a readily accepted approach to model soil moisture uh, as an index across the area. So as I said, water is driven primarily by topography. So our, our key task, the first key task was actually um, combining all of the digital elevation models into a seamless uh, array to use across the region. Um, this actually was a really challenging task because of different data sets, different resolutions, and an incredibly complex and diverse topography. Um, so this just kind of outlines some of the steps we use to kind of bring that digital elevation model together, which drives a lot of um, water flow models. Uh, across the region. Here's a composite of the input data sets. And uh, what I'll show next is actually this um, moves, goes into Canada. That large black line is the outline of the drainage basin, which is, again, there's no border in here, so no international border. So these data sets actually were combining Canadian uh, data uh, from British Columbia and the Yukon along with Southeast Alaska and USGS data into one seamless data set. So in terms of products, we now have a digital elevation model which can be, which is unified across this region, uh, which allows us to do not only uh, soil moisture modeling, but other things as well. So this was a, a huge um, uh, advance in our kind of combination of data sets uh, throughout the region. This wasn't without its challenges. And this illustration highlights one of the interesting things. The funny things happen when you cross the border. Um, the two circles highlight an area uh, of the, the U.S.-Canadian border. And the top circle, if you see, there's a thin outline that looks like a, a, a sketchy kind of uh, line there. Well, that's actually where the DEMs came together and did not match up. So a huge challenge was to try to get those matched up in a way where water would flow. That's actually a scarp, a cliff, uh, where imagine it's like a waterfall or a, a dam, right, for water going one way or another. So the bottom circle shows uh, how uh, we overcame that uh, using a program produced by um, uh, Dan Miller, uh, Terrain Works, where you can merge data sets and create a seamless uh, layer to kind of overcome those areas uh, where we had those blockages. So once we had the digital elevation model, we were moving, able to move on then into creating a topographic wetness index. The topographic index, wetness index is a fairly straightforward exercise uh, in most cases where uh, a simple equation, um, and you can see it down there in the middle of the description of our assumptions, is TWI, 
simple equation that actually combines the local, local upslope up contributing area um, uh, and the, the local, local upslope contributing area along with slope in an, in an equation. Now, the problem with that is there are a lot of assumptions that go into that. And so part of the task and the major part of our task was actually developing um, good assumptions to build into this so that we could uh, seamlessly apply this index across uh, the region. So essentially we're able to do that, unify this area into uh, um, a, D, a, a DEM derived topographic wetness index, um, which becomes a base layer and sort of a version 1.0 as a seamless soil moisture map. Now remember, this is just an index of the water from wet to, to dry, um, a, a high, if you see there in the legend, the high topographic wetness index, meaning wet areas, and low topographic wetness uh, indicators indicating dry areas. So again, it's just a first approximation of, of the area, but it, it really lends itself to broad scale regional modeling and monitoring for um, uh, moisture flow and uh, accumulation of water. And, this uh, layer is available. Uh, the website uh, is uh, noted uh, at the bottom of the, um, the bottom of the slide here. Um, so again, it's a tool. Uh, it, it can be used in, in a lot of different applications. Um, and the other thing is it can be uh, it can also be altered. Uh, again, it's all um, available in code so that it can be altered and, and adjusted for local conditions uh, for uh, different uses. So again, we wanted it to be a dynamic tool, uh, but really the goal was to apply something across this broad complex region that would be a standard um, that uh, researchers and managers could use in uh, various applications. So simply enough, uh, this, uh, this tool exists. Um, it uh, provides a base layer for soil moisture across the region. Um, but now what I want to do is highlight some of the things that it can be used for and some of the now uh, where we're progressing with this tool to sort of tailor it to some key um, questions that we have about uh, resources uh, and water in the region. So one of the um, nice things is this lends itself to uh, applications. The, the, it, the index is actually a non-specific index uh, that doesn't have any that the values are sort of uh, not related to anything tangible. So what we, the first step what we can do is, is actually relate it to a continuous variable by modeling the index um, compared to known depth to water table. So the depth to water table becomes uh, a specific continuous variable that we can then have something meaningful for what we use in planning uh, and, and modeling. So uh, the example here is a, um, a sigmoidal curve can be fit uh, you know, that transcends the wet region of the, you see the high values there along the, uh, the uh, x-axis, which is actually the top of the figure, and the dry values to the left uh, as you go down. And as you notice, the, um, there's not a lot of change in the wet areas uh, out um, to the right. Uh, and then the dry area becomes very, very apparent. But in between, there's a, there's a place in that index actually where there's a lot of variability. And that's actually in that the, the um, the transition between those wet and dry areas, which we see in a lot of our work here, there is a lot of um, a difficulty in evaluating those in-between areas which are wet and dry. And again, we have a huge amount of moisture, uh, so uh, that, that, mo that change is very subtle on the landscape, hard to model. So again, here we have the a map again of the Alaska drainage basin arrayed as a continuous variable now of uh, model depth to water, which can be used to test project areas uh, as well as um, follow uh, uh, water table depth uh, through time. So again, let me go back and try to paint a picture of a specific application, which is really valuable to us in landscape modeling. Um, back to the Katina idea, um, we know that uh, there's, a, there's a distinct association of above ground vegetation responding to the below ground conditions, specifically soils. But our, um, our soil maps are at a very coarse resolution. This slide illustrates the soil map units. And a soil map unit is just a modeled um, a, a, a collection of soil units in the field that have been 
described in the field, but are modeled as a map. Now, if you look at the numbers such as 36KC, 61T, 44JD, those are called soil map units. Those map units are not a distinct individual soil. They're actually what are called complexes. Those complexes of soils have two major soil types, and often those two major soil types are very different. The example we're using here, if we focus in the top portion of this figure, 36 KC is actually a wet um, uh, soil and a dry soil uh, combined into one mass unit. And the topographic wetness index are the colors underneath that. And you can see the stream channel, the main channel of this watershed, running through the middle of that, ma that mass unit. So you can see how much more resolution is provided by the topographic wetness index in, within that map unit and the variability in it. So what this does, and the next slide will show you the progression. So what we can do here, now 36 KC, that soil map unit is now um, identified on the left with the pink outline with the continuous um, topographic wetness index within the unit. And again, you see the variability. So one thing we can do um, in terms of applications of soils is what we call disaggregate that soil complex into its two component parts by soil moisture. And so on the right, what you see is 36 KC now subdivided or disaggregated into two distinct soil types. So this is a much more powerful approach to understanding much higher resolution response on the landscape to water. Um, one of the uses here is that we can look at um, areas that might be vulnerable to soil moisture change as opposed to others. So um, one thing we're concerned about, this figure from Charney's in a recent paper, um, Ecological Research Letters, shows the projector modeled forest growth change. And this growth change is associated not only with drought, but insect and disease. But uh, if you notice, there's a tremendous variability across North America. Um, and uh, the big concern with forests especially is what's the trajectory of change given changes in uh, temperature and moisture relationships. So how do we model this? How will we know? Well, the first place to look is how that groundwater, the sor source of the transpiration water for trees, is going to change. An interesting thing in southeast Alaska, I described how wet it is and how uh, much rainfall we get. But an intriguing part of our climate, actually, is that we do experience a drought period or where evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation during the spring and early summer months. And this graph shows that, uh, that sort of soil moisture deficit uh, in the June-July period, um, or at least close to it. Um, so again, this is something we've been watching for a few years and, and wondering about how this area might change, um, you know, how this, is, this period of time, which is the beginning of the growing season, might actually change and affect plants and soil moisture uh, in the region. These two figures are a couple of figures from my colleagues uh, at the Scenarios Network for Arctic and Alaska Planning, where they show projected um, temperature and precipitation changes. Temperature changes on the left. Um, it's pretty clear with a high degree of certainty that, that we will be experiencing increased temperatures into the future in southeast Alaska. These uh, figures are for Juneau, the capital of, uh, uh, of Alaska, and, um, in the center of southeast Alaska. On the right is precipitation. Precipitation is a lot more uncertain. And recent models are showing that the increases that we might see in precipitation may actually be due to um, larger winter storms. So again, uh, it's unclear if that increase of precipitation is going to occur during that, what I just showed, that drought period. But what we do know is that we'll probably be experiencing more higher temperatures, which would lead to higher ev evapotransfer of loss out of the soils. So again, the potential for um, uh, more moisture demand from the soils, which are not being recharged by precipitation. This figure shows some work, uh, some actual water table model we've done. The actual data is shown in the, on the black dotted and black dashed lines for a couple of different ecosystem types, our wet ecosystem types. 
And what that shows is, is some variability across the, uh, the months and that drawdown period. The red line is the potential increased drawdown with this evaporative transmittive loss uh, and not recharge. This figure shows it a little more um, uh, clearly just kind of taking out some of the um, differences and it shows it across June. And what you can see there is uh, just focusing on the middle dashed line um, for our forested wetland sites, you can see that, that the, the zero represents the soil surface um, and the negative numbers represent the depth to that water table below the surface. So if you look at about 619, 2006 there, you can see that there's about 20 centimeters of uh, aerobic zone in the surface of this soil. With increased water demand and drainage, that surface could decrease um, further. The, the red is just an illustration of what could happen if we just had a stepwise decrease in that soil moisture. Well, what that does actually is that increases the aerobic uh, area and the, the potential um, aerobic decomposition of that organic matter, just to illustrate what may happen. What we can do with the topographic wetness index and, and the fixed water table depth is start monitoring this and start tracking these changes over time and apply them to the broader landscape. So just an idea of that application. Another application um, that we've used this model for is, is actually in um, the widespread uh, um, current yellow cedar decline, where um, yellow cedar is declining due to a reduced snowpack and uh, fine root freezing. And we see this extending over uh, both southeast Alaska and British Columbia, extensive areas of the yellow cedar range. So what we've been able to do, this yellow cedar is actually prone and, and is much more competitive in wetter zones of the landscape. And so we know that it occurs, and its, 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 its propensity is to occur on wetter portions of the landscape and is susceptible to this snow-related uh, injury. So what we're able to do is combine both the TWI with our snow model. What this graph illustrates is the landscape drape of the range of uh, varying topographic wetness indexes, the dark blue being um, wetter and the light blue being drier, uh, along with that bright yellow line is actually the spring um, occurrence of snow, where snow persists into the spring. And the yellow cedar decline, the, the, the root freezing tends to occur more in the spring because we get thaw freezes, where we get um, uh, thaws followed by cold snaps, uh, which kill the fine roots. The red you see on this is the actual mapped extent of the decline across the landscape. And you can see the association with the snow. So um, using this model, uh, we're able to combine the per model precipitation as snow along with the topographic wetness index to come up with um, a cedar suitability index or a risk assessment of going into the future where areas of higher risk for yellow cedar decline would occur. So this is a management tool so managers can kind of look at an area and have some type of idea about where um, zones of risk might be uh, related to this loss of snowpack. Now, the, the one, um, we had to make uh, some compromises in this model because there were good models available for modeling precipitation as snow into the future but we couldn't yet make the soil moisture move. As I illustrated in the past slide, that's just sort of a theoretical reduction in soil moisture. We, we actually aren't sure. We need to do some more research work on that. But we do have this universal kind of regional uh, moisture index to use as a baseline and move into the future in terms of modeling uh, what, how soil moisture might change uh, to adjust this model. One last example. Um, a, a large part of our research is actually looking at the carbon flux from uh, the, this landscape. And a key part of that carbon flux is that it is very different in terms of the gaseous versus dissolved components as you move from these heavily forested, um, well-drained areas to these open illustrated here in the middle of the, this picture um, are, are sort of uh, muskeg areas or uh, poor fen bog areas, which are treeless, which become much more saturated 
and subject to uh, the excursions of dissolved organic carbon as organic acids. At present, we are using uh, what we call a hydropedologic unit. So we can use, again, going back to those soil map units, these aggregations of ecosystem types that are mapped on the landscape as polygons, as a, you can imagine, as a vector type approach where we look at, at um, just units. Um, and what at the, at the moment, we use three major units because they represent three major flux components on the landscape. And one of the things we're really worried about on the left there, you see the high concentration of the organic acids flowing out of those very wet, um, the wetlands in the, in the system. And again, those organic acids um, make a very short excursion through the freshwater system to the nearshore marine. So that's one of our major components which comes out of our wet areas. So if we had a better idea of where those wet areas are on the landscape, we could start making more continuous maps uh, for the excursion of this component uh, to the near shore. To illustrate that, so, uh, so essentially we can um, measure the excursion of those dissolved organic acids coming out of the landscape. Um, and we've been able to actually map it across the region uh, of the Southeast Alaska drainage basin. And as you see here, we've arrayed them into what we call carbon sheds, or the you know characteristic uh, loss of carbon as dissolved organic acids to the near shore marine. Um, this is a really key component of some of the, the, the dynamics of the biogeochemistry of the region. And again, this is primarily driven by that uh, huge amount of precipitation, uh, the, the quick transmission of that um, precipitation as freshwater discharge, but that freshwater discharge is mediated by its flow through the soils. And it also picks up these materials, such as organic acids, on its way to the near shore coastal. Uh, and just to illustrate, here's a photo of uh, the chlorophyll A concentrations from a NASA uh, satellite of this region. And you can see uh, clearly the, the connection between the land and the Gulf of Alaska. So um, and once you see those spirals that you see going out into the Gulf of Alaska are actually called the Sitka and Haida eddies, which are carrying this freshwater discharge along with the nutrients entrained from its interaction with the terrestrial environment out into the Gulf. Um, these are seen as, and hypothesized as really important um, kind of components of the North Pacific uh, coastal productivity, which is a big part of some of the um, things we're testing uh, throughout our, our, our present and future research in the region. But this kind of brings together this idea of, you know, why soil moisture? Why do we need to understand it? Um, what are some of the key things uh, that are happening? Uh, and, and what are the real key needs to track as we get these um, atmospheric and, and um, climate changes that are being kind of a, a press type um, disturbance on our region overall. Well, this tool that we've developed is one way that we can start um, you know, understanding that change across, across a broad region and having at least a baseline metric that we can kind of use and share uh, with colleagues to start examining some of these questions. So um, that's uh, about it for the presentation. And so, John, I guess we can, uh, I'm not sure how to open it up for questions now. Okay, so we have a real quick question from uh, Ulysses. Uh, what equipment is being used to measure soil moisture in the field? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, thanks. Um, so we've actually struggled with some of the traditional measures of soil moisture here. So there's two ways to measure, two major soil moisture components in soils. Um, the first is gravimetric moisture where water is just controlled by the um, gravity and uh, results in a characteristic water table where you have uh, water not under tension at all, so zero tension. So we measure that simply with, um, we use uh, the traditional way is PVC pipes which are slotted to actually allow that water to flow freely from the soil into the pipes and then you can usually use a hand measurement or um, uh, the, the currently we use pressure transducers, which is a sensor which goes into the tube and measures the um, amount of water over 
the sensor. So it gives you a, a, a direct measure of the level of the water over the sensor. Um, the other way to measure uh, moisture is, is water that's held in tension. And that's water that is actually under a pressure or tension in the pores of the soil. Um, there are several methods uh, that are available for doing that, um, such as time domain reflectrometry. Um, there's also um, small um, uh, electrical sensors. Uh, what's, what's really uh, difficult, the type of soils we have here um, have such high tension moisture uh, or, or water near saturation, and we have such coarse uh, materials, uh, large pores holding lots of moisture, that we don't get really good connectivity in our soils, especially our organic soils. So it's really been very difficult to get ac accurate um, tension measurements. So we use uh, depth to characteristic water table, the permanent water table. So the figures I showed are actually measurements of water depth to water table uh, in most of those. But, but that's a really good question, and it's uh, actually uh, um, important. A lot of the, the um, measurements you're seeing now, um, especially like the NASA's um, Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission and things like that, are, are measuring generally water held under tension in the soil for the, the amount of water there. And in other regions, that's really important because that is what controls the drought um, stress, or, or what we call in soil the permanent wilting point, where plants can no longer extract water from the soil. But up here, we're so wet that we tend to measure just that gravimetric water content. So um, are there any other questions out there for David? Uh, so thank you very much, David, and I'd like to also thank our uh, partners at USGS and CCWSC for uh, allowing us to continue this webinar series and look for more of them in the future.